Baptist Church, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, once again, Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit would guide and direct us into all truth tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is now lesson number 117 in our ongoing series called Understanding the Jews. And tonight's lesson carries the title, Goliath Falls before God. So last week, we finished up one of those little side studies that we do uh, that took us a little bit into the future uh, to compare another threat to Israel that King Ahab had to face in his day. And we did that to compare how God was working in ways that were similar to what we find here with David in 1 Samuel 17. Most prominently was the way that God dealt with the, I'm going to say, ill-advised boasting by Israel's enemy against God and against God's people. And tonight we're going to return to David and Goliath uh, to see the results of Goliath's boasting. So to get started, we're going to reread just one verse to refresh our memory as to what Goliath said to David, and then we will continue on from there. So we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 44. Scripture reads, And the Philistines said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. So there's not much mystery here. Uh, Goliath is extremely confident. And if David is foolish enough to offer himself up, well, so be it. He'll make quick work of him. And the Philistines will become the masters of Israel. It's their funeral. But <clears throat> Goliath's words did not strike fear into the heart of David. Let's see how he responds. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 45. Scripture reads, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. So, here David clarifies the situation. It really comes down to this. Goliath was coming to David in the power of his weapons. David was coming against Goliath in the power of his God. It was on this one single premise that everything rested. David explains the peril into which Goliath had placed himself. He says, you've defied the God of Israel, and it is in that name that I have come. And so it is not me, but God that you have challenged. And then David declares what his God is going to do. So let's go to 1 Samuel Chapter 17, two verses now, 46 and 47. The scripture reads, this is David speaking, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So here we see that David is really turning Goliath's words around against himself. That which he was threatening against David was the very thing 
that was going to happen to him. Not only him, but to his fellow Philistines as well. Goliath had pronounced his own fate. As I read this, I couldn't help but be reminded of a conversation that took place between Moses and Pharaoh. Back at the end of chapter 10 in the book of Exodus, the Egyptians had just suffered through the ninth plague, which was a three-day period of darkness. Uh, it was so intense that it could not be lightened in any way. And it pretty much immobilized all the Egyptians, and they were overcome with great fear. And because of it, Pharaoh had made the decision to let the Jews go. He'd had enough. So long as they left their cattle behind. But Moses turned Pharaoh's offer down because they needed their cattle to make sacrifices unto God. Well, Pharaoh was so incensed about Moses' rejection that he told him to get out of his palace and further that Moses should take heed that he never again came back that he would never again look into the face of Pharaoh. Because if he did, that would be the day that he would surely die. So, Pharaoh said, Moses came before his face, he would die. And in 1 Samuel 17, 44, Goliath said essentially the same thing to David. Goliath said, come before me, and you will die. And in both cases, God used the threats of Israel's enemies to pronounce not the fate of Israel, but instead to pronounce the fate of Israel's enemy. Now, most of us, I think, are familiar with Cecil B. DeMille's movie, The Ten Commandments. I'll confess that I've watched it more than once myself. But as Hollywood always seems to do, there was a considerable amount of poetic license added to the scriptural account. But there was a scene in the movie that takes place at the time that we are now in the midst of discussing. And in that scene, the mill added a bit of dialogue between Moses and Pharaoh that does not appear in the scriptures. But dialogue which nonetheless captures the essence of God's intentions, both in Exodus 10 and 1 Samuel 17. And it's this. Pharaoh had threatened Moses if there were any more plagues, a Jew was going to die. Not just any Jew, but the leader of the Jews, Moses. But there was another plague to come. And in the movie, after hearing Pharaoh's threat, Moses makes a statement. And I can't remember it verbatim. I wish I could, but I can't. But he said something to the effect, it went along the lines like this. With his own words, he has pronounced his judgment. Namely, it wasn't going to be a Jew who died, but an Egyptian. In fact, many Egyptians. Just as it was in the case with David and Goliath. Goliath threatened to kill the Israelite David, but it wasn't David who died, but the Philistine Goliath. Oh, and along with Goliath, many other Philistines as well. That message is repeated throughout the scriptures. What message? Touch not 
mine anointed. And if you do, you can expect whatever evil you intended against them to come back upon you tenfold. How many times in the scriptures have we seen that very circumstance played out? And so we see it once again in 1 Samuel 17, 44 through 47. David repeats the words of Goliath right back to him. And those words are going to be brought to fruition, not against David and his people, but as Goliath had boasted, or as he had boasted, but on himself and on his people. Let's continue on. 1 Samuel 17, we're going to look at 48 through 51. Scripture reads, And it came to pass, when the Philistine arose, and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag, and took thence a stone, and slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword, and drew it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him, and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. So the picture that we get here in this scene is that Goliath apparently had been sitting down, uh, probably on a large rock. And as David was walking towards him. And when he stood up, David changed his gait from a walk to a run. And while the sight of a fully erect giant would have given pause to almost any other man, it had the opposite effect on David. David saw the rising Goliath not as a time that causes hesitation, but as a time to act. Now, David was not superhuman, and he could not have reacted the way in which he did without knowing that God was with him. That's what made the difference. And so took one of his smooth stones out of his bag and he masterfully slung it into the forehead of Goliath. Now, quite a few people will question whether David could really have taken out this well-armed giant with just a sling. And the answer, and I'm even setting aside now divine intervention, Setting aside divine intervention, the answer is a resounding yes, absolutely. While the sling is clearly what we would call a low-tech weapon, uh, meaning that it's something that's not very expensive or even complicated to construct, it is nonetheless exceedingly deadly when in the hands of a skilled practitioner. The use of slings had been around for centuries before David. And we're told about 700 left-handed Benjamites in the book of Judges who were feared as being exceedingly accurate with a sling. And, oh, by the way, who were instrumental in defeating the army of the Moabites. It would also be an error to conclude that the stones that David was using, or were using, were small stones. The Bible says they were smooth stones, 
but we're not told their size. The fact is that the stones that were used in ancient slings vary greatly in size anywhere from fairly small stones up to the size of a tennis ball. So for that, I want to show you an exhibit we're calling Exhibit 142. And what you're looking at here are actually sling stones that were found at Tel Lachish in Israel. And they are dated to about 700 BC. But as you can see, since they didn't include a ruler in the photo, I really can't say how large or small they are. But even if they are closer in size to a marble than they are to a tennis ball, they could easily render a man unconscious, even a nine foot man. And I say that because the centrifugal force generated at the end of a sling can propel one of these stones well in excess of 100 miles an hour. Now, most of us who are sports fans, unfortunately, have seen baseball players being knocked out after being struck by a thrown pitch, a thrown baseball. It's actually pretty hard to watch without wincing, uh, but I want you to now, in your mind, replace that baseball with a stone. And think about the increase in intensity that the impact of a stone would have on a human skull. And that is the effect, that's the exact effect that is recorded in verse 49. And verse 49 records that when that stone hit Goliath in the forehead, it actually dented his skull. And he fell right on his face. What does that tell us? It tells us that Goliath was unconscious before he ever hit the ground. The natural reaction for anyone falling forward is to extend your hands to protect yourself from hitting your head uh, on the ground, especially hitting your face on the ground. The fact that Goliath fell right on his face tells us that he was unable to do that. He was out cold. He may have been dead before he hit the ground. But there was something that David still needed to do. All those Philistines were watching from the far hillside. And David needed to prove to them conclusively that Goliath was in fact dead. That he was not going to be getting back up to continue to fight. And David knew how to do that, but there was a problem. Let's reread verses 50 and 51. Scripture reads, So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword threw it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him, and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. So in those days, a common way to seal a victory over your enemy was to remove his head and to lift it up for all to see. But David couldn't do that, not with his sling, and he had no sword. So David ran up to the fallen Goliath and put his foot on his chest and removed his sword from the sheath. And then he removed his head and 
He raised it up in front of the Philistine army. Here is your champion. Now, as you may recall, there was supposed to be an agreement in place, right? Namely, that if Goliath was defeated, the Philistines were supposed to surrender. And they would then become the servants of Israel. That was the deal. But, in keeping with their duplicitous nature, that's not what they did. No. They instead abandoned their desire to conquer Israel and started running back to Philistia just as fast as their legs would take them. But if they thought that Israel was going to allow them to retreat back to their own country, they were mistaken. Let's look at 1 Samuel 17, verses 52 and 53. Scripture reads, And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sha'ariam, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. So we can determine by the last sentence in verse 52 how this pursuit played out. We're told that the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sha'ariam. And Sha'ariam is a border town in Judah of Israel. It's close to the border with Philistia. And the other two towns that are mentioned there, Gath and Ekron, are also border towns. Oh, but they are not towns in Israel. They are towns in Philistia. That means that the Israelites were not satisfied with simply chasing the Philistines out of their country. No. They crossed the border into Philistia and continued to chase them down until they had sufficiently destroyed the military capability of their army. Only then did the Israelites return. On the way back, they spoiled the tents of the Philistine encampment, which the Philistines had left in great haste when they tried to escape from the Valley of Elah. Now, after the Philistines were routed and the Israelites returned, we're told that David did a couple of things. So let's go back to the scriptures, 1 Samuel 17, verse 54. Scripture reads, And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. So these actions by David, at least that first reading, seem fairly innocuous, but they do need some explanation. I say that because at the time of the meeting between David and Goliath, the city of Jerusalem had not yet been conquered. It was not an Israelite city. It was still under the control of the Jebusites. The taking of the city would not happen until the events recorded in the book of 2 Samuel and chapter 5. So, how should we understand David taking the head of Goliath to Jerusalem in this verse? Well, one idea posits that well, David brought the head of Goliath to Jerusalem to strike fear into the hearts of the Jebusites. And I suppose that's possible, but highly unlikely. Best answer is that this verse is 
what's called a parenthetical verse, meaning that eventually David did just that. He brought the head of Goliath to Jerusalem and put his preserved head on display after he had been made king and the city was taken. The end of verse 54 appears to support that notion that what is recorded there is not, is not an instant reality, but rather a projection of a future event. Scripture informs us there that in addition to the disposition of Goliath's head, David also put Goliath's armor, armor listen, in his tent, in David's tent. But at that time, time of the Battle of Elah Valley, David had no tent. Remember that he had only arrived at the battle as a non-combatant to check on the welfare of his brothers. He was just a visitor. He had no tent, at least not right away. So the storage of Goliath's armor in what the Bible calls his own tent would have taken place at least at somewhat later time, at a somewhat later time. So as this miraculous turn of events is playing out, Oh, there is a highly interested observer taking notice. And that would be the king of Israel, King Saul. And Saul has a trusted advisor who was the captain of his army, whose name was Abner. Saul calls Abner to his side, and he begins what is a very curious conversation, a conversation that could be very easily misconstrued. And Lord willing, that's where I want to pick up in our study next week. So please remember to pray for all those on our prayer list. And until next time, shalom.